Hello, this is me coming again. I don't even know. I ain't going to call it a fireside chat without the fire. This ain't going to be the fireside chat without the fire. This is one of those uh, trigger moments. I got triggered today. All I'm doing is watching, listen, watching, watching the church on, on the, on the, uh, on the iPad, you know, watching the church and they doing all that. And they were telling the people to come on in, black folks in black church. They tell the people to come on in and uh, participate in the study at University of Pennsylvania for uh, for the brain. You know, they want, uh, you know, because uh, black people are twice as likely to get Alzheimer's as the um, white people are. and uh, But we're re underrepresented in uh, research so because uh, we don't participate in these kind of things. So they want the black people to come in and go sign up so they can do the research and so forth. And so once again, that's a trigger to me because it's like, yes, we are underrepresented in, in the medical profession and all these other kinds of things that have to do with healthcare and all these other kinds of things, research and all. But also, we got the, there's disparities in the judicial system. And see, that's the thing that, that, that has changed my life and the lives of my children, the way the judicial system dealt with us, you know, the system of government, the three ring circle. So I'm triggered there because uh, once again they had the, all this situation going on back in uh, what, what 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005. Now black people don't grow up. Talking about one day I won't grow up, I won't be outlaw. One day I won't grow up, I'll be a drug dealer. One day I grow up, I won't be prostitute. None of that. No, they have hopes and dreams like everybody else. But what happened is you get out here in this situation and you got to deal with <laughs> you got to deal with the community that you brought up in. And you know, my name was tossed around in the same sentence as death penalty. Now, I was a fugitive from justice at one time. Not because I grew up and said that I wanted to be all that, but that was a part of the, the situation, the community I was dealing with. I deal with these black folks from the South. Got caught up. Tried to deal with the people as intellectuals, talk to the people, give them an intellectual conversation and all that. But all I got was silence. Ostriches, heads in the sand, ain't got nothing to say. Quiet. And then, uh, so, so couldn't deal with a man in like, well, they messing with my wires. <laughs> Turning my brain around, like I say, the two stages of my life, I got 40 years and forward and 40 years old and back. 40 years and back, unicorn and rainbow. 40 years and forward, <laughs> you got nothing but, but chaos. I'm looking at all this stuff that they laid out before me, and I got to deal with it. And, uh, but anyway, so, so the trigger is that people talking about the, the disparities in healthcare, the disparities in the judicial system, and we not looking after our children. And these people, they not one of these people went out here, Elizabeth Singleton is the last day, and ain't nobody going knocking on her door and calling her to, to, to give these children their wealth back. You know, we talk about we got that war cry, 40 acres in a mule. You know, from back when we were enslaved, but we don't even have to go back that far for my young. All you do do go back about twenty years because these children had wealth. That woman ain't had no wealth to speak of. Everything she got was after people got dead, and then they it was drawn from the estates and stuff like that, and all the funds and all the things that was supposed to be my children's. You know, she was in charge of. Reggie didn't have no uh, trust fund or trustee or somebody to look over the estate that he had in writing so that it, these kids could be, their wealth could be looked after. None of that. Everything went to her. It was no checks and balances, none of that. So at this point, I just see that, uh, you know, these 40 acres in the mule don't even worry about the 40 acres in the mule. The judicial system needs to adjust itself so that these children, just like these, these, these people when they've been sexually abused as children, and then they can go back when they're 20 years or more, when they remembered it, and then they old enough to take action. Well, then, and, and then, like they say, homicide, you know, there's with homicide, there's no uh, statute of limitation on that because you're always dead, you ain't coming back. Same thing here. These, these, these choices that these people made against my young is permanent. It will go forth into generation after generation after generation. This, is, this, is, this will go forth. So it, there should be no statute of limitation. These children, if it was a law ever made, they, all I can do is say how I feel because ain't nothing I can do about it. I'm not a mover and a shaker. I'm a helpmate. I know who I am. I know I'm a support person. I know my strengths. I know my weaknesses. And one of them is I don't know what choice. Yeah, you know, I didn't send out letters. You know, I wrote all kinds of people back in the day when all this stuff started going on. The NAACP, all kinds of folks. I can't remember. But it's all I probably got it in my computers and all my little discs. All the little agencies and people that you think you're supposed to write when you feel like you've been, um, things have been unjust. And I feel like things have been unjust for my young. 
and there had never been any correcting of that. And it ain't too late, but I just don't know how to go about it. So I just put it out here in my own words, and uh, maybe you all can look into it when you get old enough. I don't know. But uh, there should be reparations. You all, the day took your wealth, and now you all have gone out here. You're grown now. And, uh, you know, you all should be able to have access to what funding uh, the state that your daddy had accumulated and all that kind of stuff. I mean, and sure, you were blessed in certain kind of ways because of the fact that, you know, the man had a career and stuff like that, as opposed to a job, and he was successful in his, in his little short life. So there were advantages to the fact that you all were able to go to college and all that. And when, they, when a woman couldn't handle you, yeah, she took you yeah, put you in the military school. That's not cheap. That's not something that's free. You got to be able to afford all that. So there were some, uh, some advantages. You got to look at your advantages, the advantages that you did have because of the fact that there was a life that was planned for you. Sure, it was interrupted, but it was a planned life. And uh, anybody brought you into the world and then say, let's figure out how we're going to make it uh, day to day and how we're going to buy diapers and foods and bottles and cribs and that. You all had that was a plan. And then the plan was interrupted. Folks got lost along the way. And your poor father, like I say, he had the people in his corner that should have been in his corner. Had they been in his corner, uh, he might have had a better chance of trying to figure things out when he lost his way. But <laughs> anyway, I said like the other day, I would just go ahead and make these little short videos if they come something come to mind that triggers me, and uh, I just go ahead and put it out there and let you know what I'm thinking, cause I am. Because like I say, uh, you all, <laughs> you all need to look into your history, find out what's been going on, and then come up with some names for yourself. Don't mean you need to go all forward into perpetuity with that little raggedy singleton name. What did them people do for you? They did, they, they did worse than the slave owner, the slave master. You know, you came out here and judged the, the, your family and didn't support it. And then, you know, you all out here trying to figure it all out. And then you put your, you say, life, liberty. What is it? Life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness? Uh, put you at risk. Because now you got a situation that you may, you would not have had. To you know, just like these, these, these drug dealers and all this other kind of stuff that people want to look down on. You know, these people, they, um... You know, they, they, they're movers and shakers, too. You know, the ones that's in charge. Not the drug users, but the drug dealers. The ones that's out there selling to other people and making big bucks and all that. Kind of the, the, the madams, the one running the prostitutes and keeping them out there in the brothels and stuff like that. Those people are, um, they, they, they could be, what they call it, corporate, corporate CEOs and stuff like that. But you got to deal with the community that you're in. If you don't have access... To this generational wealth and these generational uh, people that you can sit down and talk to and walk up in and uh, go into daddy's study and talk to him or grandpa's study. Daddy, grandpa, can I talk to you? Have a conversation and ask you, ask questions about, you know, the wealth and how you go about doing certain things in business and stuff like that. Cause they got that kind of history, three, four, five, six generations back. And so you got access to that. Black people ain't had that. So all you got is the community that you have to work with. And so if you're going to be a leader and a shaker, a mover, shaker, leader, then these are the people you got to work with. And, of course, it goes against the establishment, so we're always at risk for getting caught up in the system. And that's exactly what happened. I mean, the American dream is to be able to build a nest, stand, buy a home, start a business, and so forth and so on. That's the good old American dream. You work hard, and those are the things you're supposed to have. Buy a house, start a business, and build a nest egg. I, be, I bought a house, Reggie started a business. Now I'm supposed to be right here with my little nest egg. <laughs> and so I'm doing the best I can, working with what I had to work with. <laughs> you know, basically, you know, the man, I turned all my wealth over to the man to manage. You know, <laughs> I was comfortable in my little life with, with, with secure, what do you call it, secure mutual funds, savings bonds, and all these other kind of things that I've invented in real estate. That's what I was doing. But then I turned all my money over to the man to manage. He put all that stuff out there on Wall Street, you know, day trading and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, but that, that's not, you know, there was part of it. I signed on the dotted line, and I was part of that. I didn't mind at the time, but, you know, it was supposed to be, you know, we both, we both, we win, we win, we both win, we lose, we both lose. But, you know, they change. But these babies, they never signed up for none of this. You wasn't in the day trade. You wasn't in the secure, diversified portfolio. You ain't had no say about what was going on with, with the wealth that was uh, provided for you. I mean, you all had uh, bank accounts when you were still in the crib, you know, for college and for savings and stuff like that. So anyway, I don't know, the lady, the, uh, does somebody need to check in and see what's going on with your wealth? And um, I don't know what, what's supposed to happen with that, but it puts you all at risk. Because right now, these are the times that you all could be working for to build your own business or 
or going out, living off the grid, if that's what you want to do, or traveling the world, or going out here, you know, take that trip around the United States. But when somebody else took charge of your wealth, then you ain't had that. But anyway, it put you at risk for all kinds of stuff. And um, anyway, I'm going to turn this off. It was just a little short video. The people talk about going to get this research study because of brains. <laughs> Cause black people are under understudied in there. Well, we also under underrepresented in the in the uh, in the judicial system. Ain't nobody looking into why black people are always in the judicial system and what we can do about it. One thing you can do about it is hold these people accountable. Them grown folks that go out here and start changing direction, acting like con men. In fact, you feel I feel like what they call it a Casanova. <laughs> A Casanova, uh, what do they call it? A Casanova scam. Feel like I've been part of, you know, because if I pairing up with Reggie, and then after he took all your wealth and money and access to your bank accounts and stuff, and then put that stuff out there on Wall Street, now he gonna go off on his own, <laughs> go off on his way. To me, that was a Casanova scam <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. Oh, I, look, I was, I wasn't gonna talk long, but you know, all this stuff triggering to, to something else. Cause another thing, they got me in what, like I say, taxation without representation inside that court of law. I ain't need no lawyer, but I had one because he had one. I was like, monkey see, monkey do. But what they should have had in that courtroom, they needed a mathematician and they needed an accountant. They needed to figure and do the numbers, work the numbers, find out how much a call girl that's been in a relationship for 10 years, how much I would get caught, I would get, I should get paid. Because I wasn't no wife, I was a call girl for 10 years. Go ahead, do the numbers on that. And how about the, how about the surrogacy? I didn't sign up to be a surrogate mother, somebody to carry a child to bring Reggie's uh, uh, children and carry on his name into to the next generation and all this kind of stuff. I ain't signed up for that. <laughs> but I was a surrogate mother for these people. Now they now you walking around with their names. I changed that old raggedy name. In fact, I was <laughs> something you can call yourself a successman. S U C C E S M E N or M A N. You could be R Q and Terry Sussman or Overcomers or you come up anything. <laughs> anything. But yeah, you can come up with a name that, that work, both of y'all agree with and then let that be your family name. Because these people ain't putting nothing by Avatar around in there. They were worse than the slave owners. Because at least the slave owners, you knew what they were up to. You knew they were going to use you, abuse you, and then toss you down the nigga hole. It just toss you down a nigga home. But, <laughs> but you ain't expect that from your grandparents, you know, and your parents. You ain't expect that. <laughs> kind of bull crap. In fact, it's almost like I see the the the, the, uh, the image I have in my head. is like we climbing up this ladder, you know, trying to be successful in this world. And then what happens? So the demon got cold in your leg. <laughs> You're almost out there to struggle and get out here and, and sow your oats and, and live a good life and, and, you know, work towards retirement and all that kind of stuff. But then, you know, the demon will grab your leg. <laughs> and so the only way for you to get away, you either cut your leg off or you get dragged right back down into the pit so I don't know anyway <laughs> just got the image I see crazy just crazy but anyway let me turn this off I just wanted to say what was on my mind watching the church everything is a song you know, and, stuff. and it trigger me and like I said you gotta find the fun in it you gotta find the laughter because if not then what you're gonna be doing is every time you get triggered you'll be crying and sad and that's a good thing too what I learned from an early age and I don't know what y'all learned from an early age because I didn't raise you but I learned from an early age you go out here with drugs and alcohol and all that kind of stuff you follow you 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 drown your sorrows and all of that but by the time you come up down off your high, off your binge, the problem that you were running from is still there. So the drugs and alcohol is not a solution. It's just a way to escape. And because I wasn't on drugs and alcohol doing all this time, I was going through this mess with these people. My mind was <laughs> my mind was there. <laughs> so I remember it all. See, I don't need no no data to be collected. I don't need no two and three uh agencies, government agencies to, to pull pool their data and tell me what was going on in my life. And so I gotta now let this judge make decisions for me. Oh no, I was there, I was present and accounted for. In fact, I have first first person account of it all. Even though Elizabeth ain't got first person account, she got a uh, second and third person account of what was going on. But she still feel like she gonna go up there and tell these people all, all about me. 
But anyway, it was a, it was a skewed system of government, the three ring circus, and they did what they had to do. But you all got to find your happy. You got to find your way out of it. You got to find your laughter. Because believe me, young man, I wasn't laughing. <laughs> I wasn't laughing in 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005. I wasn't laughing and it wasn't funny. I was going through it, but I came out on the other side. So now I got to I gotta deal with it. That's way I deal with it because I can't forget it <laughs> until I get Alzheimer's. And then when you get Alzheimer's, you wonder how you're going to deal with it then. You know, they say you remember these things, the things that had like, uh, you know, the strong connection. Like if you were a singer, you can remember the songs, even though you got Alzheimer's, you remember the songs word by word by word, or, you know, this kind of thing. And poet, you remember your poem that you wrote word by word by word. You remember the things that had a strong hold in your life. This thing has had a strong hold in my life. So I ain't going to forget it. My question is, how am I going to react? When I do remember it, once I get Alzheimer's, if I get Alzheimer's, like, am I going to see it? Or am I still going to be laughing? <laughs> because I see the funny in it, and how chaos it is. I ain't laughing at the tragedy. I'm laughing at the comic exposure, the comic comedy of the tragedy, because it doesn't make no kind of sense. You can't make sense of it. So all you got to do is find comedy. And I hope you all can find it, too, because it ain't going to make no sense. But <laughs> what was I talking about? I was talking about the comedy and <laughs> I don't remember what I was talking about. Shoot. Let's see. It was talking. I thought it was important. I thought it was important. Oh, my God. Let's mm -hmm. see. Like the people at the church. But anyway, I guess it wasn't that important. I thought I was going to say, you got to remember. Then, <laughs> I just turned this off because I don't even remember what I was talking about. The, the brain and the comedy. <laughs> and you got to uh, make sense. You're not going to be able to make sense of it. So you can't. <laughs> anyway, love you. Bye.